Hey everyone, welcome to our virtual member uh, event tonight. My name is Robin Haney. I am the museum registrar here at the Fine Arts Center. Um, my job as the registrar is to work on exhibits and work with loans and also um, help care for and steward our collection. So what we're going to talk about tonight, and I want to say welcome to the basement. Those of you who came to our last uh, collections-based tour may remember this space. This is our collections classroom, um, but welcome to the collections part of the museum. And if you have questions throughout tonight, uh, please put them in the Q&A. Kim Sweeney is here and she will be relaying them to me as we go. There'll be opportunities where I'm kind of doing some work and you might be able to ask a question then. Um, and so please feel free to jump in with questions. So tonight we are going to be putting a backing board on one of our paintings. Um, this is something that we do kind of opportunistically in the collection. So as we are preparing an object to go out on loan, or preparing an object to go on exhibit. Um, if we're working on an object in any way and it doesn't have a backing board or it needs a new one, we'll take the opportunity to kind of stop and do that work. The painting we're working on tonight, um, this is A Still Life by Walt Kuhn. Um, the, the number here is 2005.15 um, and it was painted in 1938. So, um, those of you, again, who attended the last one will know I'm not a curator. <laughs> so your art history questions would be better directed to those folks. But if you have questions about the collection side, the material aspects, um, any of that sort of thing, I'll do my best to answer. Um, so we'll kind of jump in. I want to start a little bit just talking about what the purpose of backing a painting is or putting a backing board on a painting is. You can see right now um, we have the painting in the frame without any sort of protection on the back. Um, historically, this would have been pretty common. Backing boards weren't really a, a trendy in like conservation until about 40 years ago. Uh, 40, I don't know if that's something like four. Um, but they serve a variety of different purposes and there's a lot of different ways um, we can, we, a lot of different things we can try to achieve by adding a backing board. Can you switch to this? Um, so one of the things they do, one of the major things they do, especially for our collection, is protect the canvas and the frame from accumulating a lot of dust and uh, debris. And we'll dust this one and we'll kind of show you a little bit of the cleaning uh, involved there, but it can help protect the canvas from grime and dirt and dust buildup. It can also help protect um, the canvas from damage from the back, so puncture wounds or um, any sorts of scrapes that might happen. It's if you, if you want to have a backing board serve this purpose, you can create a microclimate. So you can actually kind of try to control the environment for the, the painting itself using specific types of backing board materials um, and kind of like a little gasketing layer. We're not going to do that. Our environment at the museum stays pretty stable. We tend to keep um, around 50% relative humidity and our, our fluctuations aren't very high. Um, and we keep the reason, you know, 68 to 70 degrees temperature. But if we live, if we were a historic house or we had a different climate or we were concerned about um, kind of the effects of our climate on this object, we might utilize a, a plastic backing board with a, a little gasket to try and create a, a better environment for this object. Even just this um, archival cardboard backing board will help buffer changes in relative humidity and temperature. Um, and that's really important because what happens when an object absorbs or releases moisture is that it can swell or it can crack. You guys have probably all seen um, like a piece of wood that's dried out and it starts to crack. Objects react to the, to the water in the air around them. And so this backing board, even though it's just a, a layer of cardboard will help kind of buffer and slow those fluctuations, which will give the object kind of more time to accumulate and less of, a, of an event to react to. Um, so I also want to say, oh yeah, what are the uh, white tags? Oh, so these white tags are um, kind of some historical information about the object. So I don't know if you can see this, it says Kuhn. So that's the artist's name. Um, this says the location in our storage before, that's where we can find it, and then the accession number. Um, a lot of our objects are tracked this way. Um, one of the advantages of adding a backing board is that we can actually track that information on the board itself, which I will show you. So we can keep that there. This this frame also happens to have that on a, a plastic tag, which we um, are moving away from. We won't we wouldn't necessarily do this now to put a sticker on the object itself. Um, 
So they just help us keep track of things. Some, some organizations use barcodes. We could do that with our database. We just don't have that system implemented yet. Uh, I also wanted to say, we're gonna do this a little bit like a cooking show. So I've done some work ahead of time um, so that you don't have to sit here and watch me like drill holes and uh, do some of the more tedious elements of this. So um, full disclosure, some of the work has been pre-done, but I'm gonna walk you through the whole process. Um, another thing I'm gonna take advantage of this opportunity to do is actually to take off the hanging wire and to replace the hanging hardware. So right now there's two little eyelet screws um, and we're gonna switch to D-rings, which look like this, um, which provide a more stable kind of attachment. You can put it on two points on the wall rather than just one on a wire. So uh, again, just being opportunistic and taking advantage of, of what we have um, time to do. When we already have the object out and we're already working on it. Um, I cheated a little bit. I pulled this object specifically for this event because size worked well, <laughs> but normally I wouldn't just go through and randomly grab an object. I would um, be prepping it for some purpose, like an exhibit or uh, a loan or a class visit or something. Um, so I'm gonna actually remove the hand. Oh yeah, okay. Um, do you, sorry, I'm gonna, yeah. I might be, you might have to repeat the question. Um, do you consider the whole thing, the painting and the frame as the object to preserve? So that's a really good question. The question was, uh, do you consider the whole thing painting in the frame as the object to conserve, it kind of depends on the object. So some frames come in, in an artist frame or an original frame or even a historic frame. And in that case, it is kind of considered um, an object in and of itself. It might get an accession number. So we have like the paintings A and that object is B. Um, but sometimes we'll have frames that are clearly not, that were repurposed for that object or um, very contemporary. And so those may not, have that same designation. It just depends on the context of the object. Um, this frame, I don't know enough about it. So uh, we will consider it, we're kind of considering it part of the object for these purposes. So another reason um, to re back this object or to take the opportunity now, I don't I know if it's clear, but we have um, little tiny nails holding the frame. There's only little three little nails or four little nails actually keeping the painting in the frame itself. Um, and that doesn't feel super secure. So we wanna make sure that the frame is held very securely. I mean, the painting is held very securely in the frame. So the first thing I'm actually gonna do is to remove um, the painting from the frame so we can make some adjustments and also replace this hardware. So I'll hold it up so you can maybe see. Just these little tacking nails. Um, sometimes these go through the actual stretcher. This one wasn't, these were just bent holding it in place. Um, some these were nailed into the, the frame itself. Um, but yeah, they're not, not sufficient anymore. There were more of them. I can see evidence of where there used to be other nails and they've been um, kind of lost in the, during the course of things. So, so now we have the painting and it can come out from the frame, but before I remove it, I'm gonna dust it. The canvas itself isn't too dirty, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. I'm not actually gonna do any cleaning on the canvas, but I am gonna dust just the, um, the stretcher and the frame itself. So to do this, I have um, a very cool variable suction vacuum. It's a HEPA filtered vacuum and it has uh, different speed settings. So I can make it go super high suction or super low suction. So I'm gonna use it on the lowest suction. And you'll see here, I've actually covered the nozzle um, with a protective layer so that if during the course of cleaning, it's un highly unlikely, especially on this object, something does detach, it's caught and it doesn't get sucked into the vacuum. So we can then um, get it conserved or reattached to the frame. So. I will take um, a soft, natural hair bristle brush and um, dust. I'm not actually gonna touch the object with the vacuum. I'm gonna dust into the vacuum um, using the brush. And you will hear the vacuum noise. So I'm not gonna speak for just a, a second while I do this, but Kim will catch up on the questions maybe. Okay, so this isn't actually super, super dirty, um, but kind of dusty from hanging out in storage. I protected for <laughs> who knows how long. Um, so now I'm gonna take the painting out of the frame itself. As you can see, um, do we wanna, can we? Um, this painting, the support for this painting is called a stretcher. And it's called that because those, the kind of um, triangular shaped pieces in the corner actually can be used to tension 
the bars so you can uh, retention your painting or adjust the tension if needed as it's reacting to its environment. This stretcher is missing three keys. It should have two in every corner. Um, that's not something I'm going to fix now, but it is something I'll note in the database so that next time we're working on this object, we can probably replace those keys as well. I'm gonna set the painting to the side for now um, while I continue to work on this. So inside the frame, we have the part where the um, painting sits. And this, this part right here is called the rabbit. Um, and you can see here, this one's actually lined with fabric and that was a linen liner that's visible when I turn the frame over. Um, but too much, uh, a kind of a scratchy surface can actually wear down the edges of your painting. Um, and, and I'm starting to see that on this canvas. So I'm gonna line the rabbit with an, um, a felted polyethylene. So a pretty stable plastic um, felt, very soft material that has an acrylic adhesive. And I wanna say thank you to um, our new digital collection assistant, Gabrielle, for helping me prep some of these materials and cut some of the stuff. Uh, super grateful for her to do that. So I take this felt and it's nice because it has a sticky backing. So I can go ahead, peel off the back and just stick it right down. So I wanna be careful that this provides enough protection but doesn't actually extend over and, and become visible from the front. Um, how did you get into this line of work and what's your background? So I started working with collections. I started uh, studying Egyptology as an undergrad and I was into archeology. span And then I worked for the city of Boston archeology span lab um, after graduating from undergrad. And there were so, so many objects and so much stuff that had been excavated and not cared for very well. Um, that it kind of made me reconsider and realize that actually what I'm more interested in is preserving cultural heritage. So I went to graduate school for objects conservation, which is uh, care um, and repair of objects. And then from that, I started working in museums and got into kind of more museums collection and collection administration. Um, but I still like to do the hands-on things like this. Okay, our rabbit is lined. So we can put our painting back in. Um, I, this is actually a Kim question. Yeah. Uh, why is it called a rabbit? I have no idea. <laughs> I wish I knew. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a strange term. I'll pop the painting back into the frame. Uh, so I might not have mentioned this when I took it out, but between the, um, the frame edge and the painting, there were several pieces of cork which again is not an uncommon material to find, keeping it centered in the frame and holding its position. I took these out and I'm actually gonna replace them with more of this archival um, heritage board or blue board because I know the content of it, I know how it's gonna react and it's a, a pretty good stable material to use. But I wanna make sure that I add some little spacers so that um, the painting stays in the center of the frame and isn't uh, capable of moving, wiggling around on me. Uh, one of our attendees just Googled what a rabbit is. Oh yeah. It's actually a rabbit with an E. Huh? Um, and so I'm gonna, it's kind of, it's big, you know, I'm gonna copy and paste the answer into the comment section for everyone to look at. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's, Nathan. that's cool. I wanna know. All right. Um, okay, so now we've got the, uh, rabbit lined, the painting in, it's in place, um, we can put the backing board on. So like I mentioned, I pre-drilled the backing board. There is still going to be some time where you're going to be watching me screw little tiny screws in. Um, I might not do all of them so you don't have to see. <laughs> Just I'll do enough to get it in there so you guys get a feel for, for what it will look like. I am using, uh, I want to say these are number six, brass screws. So any hardware that I'm going to put into the, um, the object itself, the painting itself, I'm going to try to use a metal that's less likely to corrode or stain as it corrodes. So copper alloy, um, you know, could potentially corrode, but I am much more, more comfortable using this than um, anything that might rust. So anything that has iron, a ferrous based material, just to make sure that I'm not going to stain my object. 
Okay, so I will I will do the rest of those screws, I promise. But I'm gonna move on to the next step just in, in the interest of, of time. Um, so the next thing I wanna do, I've got my backing board on my painting, my painting in my frame, but it's not secured in the frame quite yet. So I'm going to use um, an offset clip. So this is a little Z-shaped clip. It's used for a lot of different reasons in framing. And these are commercially available, although I did bend them to actually better fit on my object. And I will use those to hold the object, to hold the painting into the frame. So I'm gonna screw it into the frame. It doesn't get screwed into the stretcher. Uh, had this object been more flush with the frame or even like um, less proud than the frame, I might not have screwed the backing board into the stretcher at all. I might've just put it into the frame. I'd rather have new holes in my frame than in my stretcher. Uh, just kind of as a matter of course. But that is, again, kind of an institutional and conservator by conservator preference. There's no real definitive right or wrong. So I'm going to use enough of these so that it feels secure. So you'll remember that there were four nails holding it in um, in random places throughout the... Painting. So I'm going to put two, at least two on each side. Um, and like I said, so I already wrote the accession number and the artist and the title and the date of the object on the backing board. So that's nice. And that won't um, become removed. Nobody will really be able to take that off without a lot of intervention, like a tag that could be cut off or just displaced. Um, just that one. Um, what is this backing board made out of? So this is archival cardboard, some people call it heritage board. Uh, it's just a really pure cardboard you can get from a like museum supplier, so Gaylord Brothers or University Products. It doesn't have a lot of um, commercial, like the brown cardboard you see has high acidity or high lignin content. This doesn't have that. So it's not going to release things that harm the objects over time. So a lot of museums use this like so many purposes. It's a, a really nice tool for many different things. Um, okay, the last thing I'm going to do is remove these eyelets and replace the hanging hardware. Um, because we want those D-rings. Those are our preferred hanging hardware. And this I didn't pre-do, so you can see me. Sometimes these are just finger tight and sometimes they get a little more agency to come out. I also, so I, I uh, last museum where I worked was in earthquake zone. Um, and so we were really careful about the hardware we chose, but I like D-rings and I like D-rings with two holes. Um, the two holes keep the D-ring from slide, sliding around. If they're just on one hole, they can pivot, but if they're secured on two holes, they're not gonna change orientation on you. So you know when you go to hang it, it's not gonna have moved around left or right on that swivel point. So I always put two whole earrings on my object. All right, and now this painting is pretty much ready to go back into storage, um, which leaves us with some time for questions. Okay, are there any last minute questions? If there's glass, how do you clean the glass? Ah, it kind of depends. So some glasses, so, um, Museum glass options, again, run kind of like a wide range. You have several different types of plexiglass and anti-glare coatings and um, lots of lots of different parameters. So um, it really varies depending on what type of glazing you have. So I wouldn't ever use a commercial product like Windex or something like that. I might use some alcohol and water. I probably would try just distilled water first, but um, but yeah, glass can be really tricky because you can you can ruin a coating if you use the, the wrong type of solvent. Um, if you if you need new glass, where do you get it? Uh, it depends. So it kind of again depends on what your purpose is. So uh, if you want to get, you can get glazing that will actually protect your object from um, some types of light. You can get UV blocking glazing, which is really great if it's in your house and it's you know get sunlight from the window. Um, it's Somewhat pricey at the outset, but will really last a long time and like help prolong the life of your objects. 
Um, and that you have to order specially, probably from a, a frame shop. Frame shops in Colorado Springs. I'm still too new to, to have really good relationships with people down here. Uh, Metropolitan Frame in Denver, I know could, could be a source for that. Uh, but like plain glass, you can get from a hardware store. Um, you'll get really sharp edges on that, so you have to be, be careful. Most of our collection like this isn't glazed. Uh, we do glaze objects if we know they're going to be traveling a lot or um, on view a lot. So like the portrait of Elsie Palmer, that our John Singer Sergeant, um, one of our John Singer Sergeant paintings is going to go out on loan again and we'll probably put a, a glazing over it. Um, but we got like, you can buy, if you want to spend the highest end is an anti-glare UV glazing. So you can't really see that it has um, glass on there. Um, what kind of wire will you attach to the D-ring? So I won't use a wire after this. So I'm trying to move away from uh, the wire with the one point of attachment and we'll hang the D-rings directly on. I'm gonna step out of, well, maybe you can still see me. Um, directly on hooks. So some of our hooks for our racks look like, that's hard to see, um, look like this. And this is gonna go back in storage. So it'll be on a hook somewhat similar to this. I don't wanna hold this little object. Um, and then we'll use kind of floriat hangers in the gallery, which are similar, like little J-shaped hooks. Okay. That's all our questions. Awesome. Thanks everyone for coming. You'll get a follow-up email tomorrow um, with all the details that Robin mentioned. And uh, keep an eye out for your member emails for more, more events like this. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>